Hello. Hey, what's happening? How are you? You hurt yourself too. Mm -hmm. Winter sports. I understand. Not the way to go. Who good knew, to right? Hey, it's it's great to see you. Thank you so much for sure. welcoming me. This is so yeah. beautiful. Oh yeah, I'm glad we could do it. Mr. Bill, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. How are you? How's your uh, leg? I look better than you, I think, with the arm. You absolutely do. Yeah. So is it this one? Left one, yeah. Up top? Uh, right at the knee. It was basically a knee injury more than a Snowmobile? Was, uh, snowboard. Hmm. It is quite ironic, isn't it? Won. It yeah, won. Well, I'm one, too. Yeah. So. I'd have more horsepower, but I'm mean, one, too. So. Well, understand. Well, Thanks Thank for having you. us. This is great. I know. Catherine said this is your baby. This is like your... I'm here a lot. Yeah, right here. Uh, fish here. Some good fishing out here, so. Awesome. Yeah. I was so excited to, to sit with both of you because I think, Chase, a while back, you had told me that Eric was easily one of your favorites, right? And so this has been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. I've listened to your music for so long. I feel like the first time I heard your music was back when someone handed me a CD in like 2006 and was like, let yeah. me know what you think of this guy, right? Yeah. And, um, and to see this come together is awesome, but the circumstances surrounding both of you is, I mean, how ironic, right? We've got a broken shoulder, a broken leg, knee, knee. But, or whatever you want to call he it. Started. Yes, I he started. started it, right. He <laughs> yeah. started it. He started what, it. What the heck happened? What happened? Yeah, just, uh, I guess, playing around where I shouldn't have been playing around, I guess. No, just, uh, yeah, for me, it was snowboarding. So I think both snow related, but um, the snow won, I think, in both accounts. Yeah, for me, snowmobiling for me, but yeah. I mean, what, I mean, can you guys talk a little bit just about what happened? If you don't, just sharing the experiences a little. Let me go first. Chase. Either way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, his story's better, but I mean, for me, um, we 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 were in Utah, and we so every every year during spring break, my whole family skis, and and we pick a spot and we change every year, and we'll go. Last year was Telluride. The year before was Jackson Hole. So we go to a different place every year, and this year was uh, Deer Valley. And we had skied for five or six days. It was glorious. It was great, great snow. And so I decided, and I kind of pushed my wife on it, but I said, let's go snowmobiling. Let's do something different. You know, we skied for so many days. Let's go do it. And they've had so much snow out there, at least for me. Um, I hadn't been on a lot of snowmobiles either, but um, I caught an edge. And um, the scariest part is I had my, my eight-year-old with me, my mm -hmm. youngest. And we he crashed with me. So you're more concerned about him. And... Um, Luckily, he's okay, but I, I broke my broke my shoulder pretty good. So you know, that's my my thing. I heal up. Yeah, heal, so luckily, I don't need my arms to do what I do. Right, not a little bit, right? <laughs> so when when that happened to you, though, was that what what was going through your mind? Him the whole time mm -hmm. for me. I mean, I carry ended up carrying him. We were um, we were ten miles from where we started and with no cell phone service. Oh so he hit his head pretty good. He had a helmet on, but he hit his head pretty good. So we were concerned about a concussion and ended up calling paramedics. We ended up getting service calling paramedics. And um, so I ended up carrying him on this shoulder at his helmet. The reason I remember is I had his helmet in my right hand. I ended up carrying him four or 500 yards to get him back to where he could be evaluated. And I never felt my shoulder at all. It was a couple, three hours later that um, it started to be a problem. It's the adrenaline yeah, the kicking adrenaline. in. Yep. And then you, I'm my not... story's not near that good or long. I, well, I was just out, uh, I was just out snowboarding with a with a friend of mine. Um, grew up snowboarding in a very familiar place that I had been going to for a long time, and just kind of caught that perfect storm and landed on my knee wrong. And unfortunately, it was that was the day it was going to give out. So just uh, yeah, I fractured in a couple different places, um, but actually, all things considered, it was not as bad as I think it could have been. So mm. oh, I think we're, we're on the back end of it. So it should did be good. you know right away that it was bad? I had a pretty good feeling. Um, you know, at the time I'm, I was, you know, just, uh, kind of towards the end of the trip, you know, getting ready to head to the, to the next race. So I had a pretty good feeling. It was, it was hurt. I've never really had a, any serious injury before this. So this was kind of my first, uh, my first one. And I had a pretty good idea. I was, I was going to be in trouble, so. Well, and for both of you, really, but for you being in the <clears throat> midst of what you're doing, Chase, was it like, were you, what is that like? How does that, you know, process in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, 
I didn't feel like I was being irresponsible or doing anything that I wouldn't do any other day. Um, but it was just one of those situations where, yeah, the timing was, was bad and it was that perfect storm. And, and at that point in time, I, I knew that it didn't feel good, but obviously hadn't been to the hospital yet. Um, I had a pretty good idea before I got there that I probably wasn't headed to Vegas uh, in a couple hours. So, yeah, unfortunately, I was I was right. Was on there that a one. phone call that was hard, like that you were kind of nervous about making? In that circumstance? yeah, there, there was a few. There was a few phone calls I was nervous about making, but um, honestly, everybody was was really cool. I feel like probably mm-hmm. way cooler than I was expecting them to be about it, and um, totally understood. And and I feel like understood, you know, why I was there and why I was doing what I was doing, and. Um, the fact that I've, you know, been snowboarding for a long time and that's not something super uncommon, I guess. So I guess them knowing that about me, they trust my judgment a little bit and and going out and and having a good time. And, um, well, also it's part of the conversation. Like, I mean, there have been art, like Ryan McGee had a great article about it. You know, people do what they do and you've got to let them do what they do sometimes, especially when I think Kevin Harvick was quoted on it talking about how what we do is such a lifestyle. It's so hard that you've got to get your outlet somehow, which is probably similar, but maybe for you, I'm not. Yeah. When I first bought this property out here, um, I used to cut trees down. That was my, um, with chainsaws, with chainsaws. That was my escape. And, uh, I don't do that anymore. But I did it for a long time because there's so much focus that goes into, and at that time, that would have been the chief era. So I had a lot of noise, a lot of stuff, stuff going on. It was a way to come out here. And if you're not focused on a 30, 40, 50 foot oak, where it's gonna fall, if that's not something that's got your attention, it can kill you. And there was something so micro of that. It was a way for me to escape what was going on in the world that I could get a chainsaw and I could go cut the tree and then process the tree, and it just got me away from that. And that's not something I would recommend. I don't do it anymore, but at that time, it was very important to me. It was something that, that mattered to me. So whether it's, it's it's snowboard or snowmobiling, or you have to have that pressure valve that you can release that steam um, when you do something that's um, exceptional. And if you, do, if you do exceptional stuff, you have to have something like that to retreat to. So you think that's something that comes with a certain level of... I, I do, yeah. Because do. that's what's required. That's right. There's, there's, a, there's a focus, and, and when you're operating at a certain level, whether it's an elite athlete or it's a musician or whatever, you do have to have some way to release what that builds up, in my opinion. I, I agree, personally. I mean, I, I think there's... And, and, you know, I think a lot of people see just on the stage, right, or just on the track, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on off the stage or off the track yeah. and obligations and probably I would even argue maybe more so balancing all of that stuff more than yeah. the actual job itself. Um, I think that balancing act is really important and, and, and I agree you, you need, you got to have ways to go enjoy yourself because it can very easily become unenjoyable very fast if you get tied up in the wrong, in the wrong aspect of it. How do you do that? How do you, because there's a lot of compartmentalizing, right? That time, like how, I mean, how do both of you do what you do and make it work? I, I think for, that's a very <laughs> tough question. I think for me um, personally, I, I, I think uh, I was, you know, dad taught me at a very young age to take this very seriously, that there's a lot that's going into this. It's not, it's not a, joke right and and i think i've always carried that with me over the years and i take my job very serious i don't i don't go to the racetrack and mess around i don't go and 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 do a lot of things that i probably could do um just because i don't take for granted the opportunity that i have in front of me to go and make a living the way i do it's just not something that's given every day and i don't i don't want to ever uh, i don't want i don't want to ever disrespect that or feel like i'm disrespecting it so uh, for that reason, I just always take the job very seriously, and I probably always will, just because that's how, how I've always been. Yep. Um, and I think to compete, you know, it's probably—I mean, I've never played on stage, but I would imagine there's a, there's some similarities and probably some differences in that. Um, but for me, I think just that competition aspect of it is always what brings me back, um, and it's just something I take very seriously. And, and I, that that's kind of been the big one like for me. Like the fuel, you mean? Yeah. Like that's the fuel that drives you. And Lindsay, I, w- I would say that there, there's you, you realize at some point in time in your career that there's so many people that don't get the opportunity 
that you're currently getting. And you know, whether it's racing or whether it's, you know, the number of people that get off a bus today in Nashville with a guitar that are good is high. So you realize yeah. at some point in time that you get to do this. And if you don't treat it with that amount of respect, Chase said it really good right there with, um, you think about the people that came before you, um, you think about um, putting something up on that mantle musically or racing wise that other people will look at and measure uh, themselves and you against. And I think that if you have that respect for your craft and for the people that were, came before you, you treat it that way. I love that because it is like, it's sort of, for a long time I've thought NASCAR drivers, you guys are a tick off. And I mean that so respectfully in a great way, meaning to do what you do, right? You want to do what you do. It is highly risky. It's highly, you know, it's, it's exciting. It's all the things. But I guess there, yeah, there's an interesting parallel in that. And I think it's sort it's kind of like greatness, but you're right. Thinking about those people that you just talked about with guitars, getting off the buses, like, they're the difference, right? What's the difference? Like, but, but so I just think it's interesting. Well, I mean, it, it was, first of all, you had to be committed to the moment. I mean, he's operating at, you know, near 200 mile an hour, mm -hmm. right? We're 50,000 people with a guitar in your hand. If you're not committed to that moment, you're not going to meet that moment. And I think a lot of, um, not only is uh, NBA, everything's the same. You have to meet the moment. And I think that um, understanding that and being able to do that and how you build your craft too. I mean, Chase didn't walk out and just jump in a, in a cup car and start, you know, they call it cup cars anymore. That's yeah. the old days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so jump jump in a cup car and do it. It took it took a process, right? I didn't just jump and I didn't just go play the Super Bowl, right? It, it, you you got to start along the way. And I think that building your craft and, and, and cultivating that is and being confident in that is what makes that, what makes it work. I was thinking about the um, the journeys that both of you have had because I think there are a lot of circumstances that are similar time wise for you guys. Like I was talking to Chase about 2011. That's when Chief, right? That was mm -hmm. the time of Chief, mm -hmm. and that was when we were talking about it that you had an accolade in Sports Illustrated being a high school um, like athlete to watch, right? So that's funny. 2020, <laughs> you win your championship. Yeah. Eric wins CMA yeah. Entertainer of the Year, right? Yeah. It's interesting to me, the parallels. What a year, what a year to win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> saw it. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. No uh, banquet. No, yeah. no, no, no nothing. No, no yeah. nothing. Yeah, just here's the trophy. Go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it was. It was That was normal. That's 100%. Man. That was normal yeah. at really? the time. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? Did it? Did that's, that, 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 was, that, was, that is what it was like. Yeah, that's why I want, I want another one. He probably does too for the same reason. It's like I yeah. want to do this the right way. You know, it's like. Fuck. What, so what's the connection? How did this connection start for you guys? So we them? we met. I mean, I think the first time we met. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was in a it was in a meet and greet. It was, yeah. You know what city? It was? I didn't even. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you would remember that or not, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, we were in Atlanta. We were somewhere like Gwinnett Arena or something yeah, like that. It was Gwinnett, I think. I think yeah. Like around 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. somewhere in that time frame. So it would have been near Outsiders, it would have been Outsiders tour yeah, probably. I think yeah. it was. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I was, you know, he didn't know me and, and that was totally fine. I just, you know, wanted to go to a show, right? And yeah. it was the closest one down the road. And um, honestly, I feel like this is the first time I've actually met you and we've ever had a conversation. So right. mm -hmm. um, I guess today, right now. But so that was right after you had won the Xfinity Championship, right? It was, A short yeah. time after. Yep. Um, that's really like cool. just a few weeks, yeah. Okay, what was it about Eric's music that has touched you from the beginning? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's a really tough thing to ask when the guy's sitting sorry, right, is that weird? <laughs> right there I know. in front of you. No, but, um, you know, I think for me, um, I was introduced to his music, I would say probably around 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Um, I have... I didn't grow up with siblings in the house, so a lot of my um, friends and, and cousins are all five, six, seven years older than me. And, and I think for that reason, probably introduced me to some things that I don't know that I would have found um, hanging out with my buddies at school. Um, and for that reason, I think a lot of Eric's music was getting hot and, and, and getting to be known at that time. That was how I, I learned about him and, and started listening to his music. and. And from there, for me, it was, um, 
when you when you start to travel up and down the road, you have a lot of time to think, and sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Um, but that does give you a lot of time to listen to music, and for whatever reason, his his way to and this is one thing I've admired about just musicians and artists in general is to be able to. It always blows my mind when I go to a concert that people are singing words back to you that started in your head. You know how how that process works and and you can put those thoughts on paper and and turn them into a tune and into a melody. I think that's an incredible piece of of music that probably doesn't get enough appreciation. Uh, And for whatever reason, his music always spoke to me the most um, for, for, I guess, the writing aspect of just, I don't know, just some words make more sense than others. and, And that was why I got into it. And Lizzie, there's a lot of correlation with, he talks about riding up and down the road. I mean, that's where a lot of these songs came from. It's where, where I came from. I mean, we, we both in some way travel to our next mm-hmm. destination, whether it's a race or a show. So there's a lot of, um, I get the relation because there, there's a lot of those songs that if you listen, um, we live a similar lifestyle, you know, and I, I think that um, that's awesome to hear. I think the, the least awesome thing is when he starts talking about how young he was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't know if I should go there, but you know, it's part, I, it's part of the story, right? I, and it is. I, it's a piece I, of it. Yeah. I, I picked him up and signed his shirt. You know, I, I held him for a little while first concert. <laughs> yeah. Burped you. Not, not yeah, that yeah, young. Yeah, not yeah, that no, young. I know, I know. Close. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, anyway, it's, it's a really, uh, it's it's a really cool and neat thing, you know, to to see something like that. Are you me. the guy that um, that like will play a song and then play it over and over and over before switching to a different song? Uh, no, I feel like you know, like if an album comes out, I'm I'm probably one who it, it's pretty apparent like which songs on the album everyone knows. I'm the one who wants to go listen to the ones that everyone doesn't know and, hey, and try to find like that that piece yeah. in there that. Uh, that grows on you to me yeah. music that grows on you over time and that's, Same way. <clears throat> that's something about his music that I think is really cool and there's not a lot of artists like that that if their music gets better the more you listen to it that's that's doing something in, in my opinion and, yeah. Yeah. and I think a lot of times those songs that are in between the ones that you hear on the radio tell that story the best they're all they're, 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 all, they're pretty good road markers to get you to the songs he's talking about the, the first tour uh, arena tour that I ever did. So Chief comes out. So I came from bars. I came from clubs. Mm-hmm. And I've got these little small places and I've got these people in front of me that I understand. And then Drinking Man comes out and Springsteen comes out. And all of a sudden I go from the people that I know to I'm playing an arena. And we got 15,000 people. And I didn't know how to do that on that tour because what I thought was they're all here to hear Drinking Man and Springsteen. So I would kind of coast to those songs. And what I learned is the show is about the songs between those songs and to what he's talking about. It's not about Drinking Man and Springsteen. It's about those other songs that tell the whole story. And it took me a tour to figure that out. My least favorite tour of my career was the, the Chief Tour. And, right. that was, so and that was the biggest album we had. But I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. Right, I, I came from bars and clubs, and I was trying. I was like, "Well, they're here to hear Springsteen or drink them, whatever we had at the time." I'd never had hits, so I didn't know how to mm-hmm. deal with it. And it was always like, "Okay, okay, play, 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 play." Here's smoke a little smoke, drink in my hand, Springsteen. That's how we ended. So everything. even though you had had hits like top twenty hits, that's yep. not I a never, hit. No, you mean I like never, you mean I, the, I never had like a generational hit, right? And, and and I didn't deal with it very well. And, and so what I learned. Because you felt like you weren't connecting? Is I that felt like the other songs were just songs for me, and they weren't people that were there. They were there to hear Drink in My Hand, Springsteen. So to his point, it's those Those are really good uh, markers. They're really good maps. But the real songs are the other ones. Like when you go to a Springsteen concert, yeah, you want to hear Born to Run or whatever. But yeah. it's those other ones. It's the pacers that take you through it that makes the show. And it took me a minute to learn that. How would you learn it? I learned it from fire, going through the fire. I didn't. I did, I, it wasn't something I called anybody. I learned it from not enjoying my first. It was, I think it was a. Um, I forget the name of the tour. I think it was Blood, Sweat, and Beer's tour, but um, it was during the Chief album. So we went from here to biggest artist in music, and not just country in music. And I did not know how to handle it. And um, wow. I think it took me a second to realize that hey, 
they like the other songs too. You know, they're not just here for that. <laughs> those two songs. Safe, safe to say. Yeah, I just didn't know where people came from. You know, it's like all of a sudden you went from you know I could fill this room up here to you're filling an arena, and I thought, what, what where well, did these people come from? You especially, know, so. I mean, that's also kind of relate, like in a weird way too. It's relatable to my industry. It's like you think you know who the people are that are watching you. Like when I'm doing Sports Center, I know who that is. But when you're doing something else. Frankly, that's how I felt going from that to doing sideline reporting because I'm like, I don't know who, right? It's when your norm feels shaken a little bit, then you don't, it's a weird feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm not comparing myself to you. No, no, but I But I'm saying it. like no, it's, I, yeah, yeah, right. it's relatable on some level. Um, so, well, how about you? So starting starting out the way you did, you know, you had your dad there as a, as a significant guide. Um what have you had experiences like that? Where you? I got a question. Can I ask questions? Oh, Can please. I, is was it hard with your dad? Was it hard, especially being younger? Because I think about was, was that was it was it the expectation part or, or the? I mean, right? That's natural. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting you ask that because I was wondering today too. I'm like, you know, obviously we're not the same age, but I knew you had a couple younger boys, and I'm like, you yeah. know, that's interesting because. You know, they right. might, they right. could potentially be in a similar that's position right. as me one day. That's correct. Um, that I grew up in. So I was like, yeah, that's kind of, that could kind of make sense, right? Or hit home a little bit. But for me, I think it was, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I have feel like my parents and, and, you know, I, I put mom into that category too, because I think she had a, had a big role in, in, obviously raising me and, and going to the racetrack. I mean, dad was doing a lot of racing and a lot of times it was me and her going to the races, uh, too. So, you know, I think that she deserves a lot of credit and, um, or not credit. I don't know that you want to take credit or not, but nonetheless, she was involved. Um, and, and I feel like the way that they kind of brought me up and allowed me to live my life and to do the things that I want to do, it was, it was always my choice and, and racing was always my choice. If I went home you know, whether I was 10, 15, 20, if I went home and said, hey, mom and dad, I don't want to do this anymore, it would have been totally fine. And and they always made that really apparent to me. Um, and I think because of that, it was, it kind of became my own path, at least in my eyes. Um, and, and I'd never really looked at the expectations of, you know, dad's career or things that he accomplished i mean of course i want to i want to get there yeah um because i want to go home and have a personal conversation about those things not because i care yeah. about what everybody else yeah. thinks but yeah like on a personal level i'd love to one-up him absolutely like i'd love to what was the first that. thing when you jumped in a like, was it a go-kart do you start like in go-kart yeah and, like like you know how old mm, i was uh about eight so fairly young i mean obviously at that time i mean it's not you're not seriously racing at eight, right? It was a hobby and you were out having a good time. Um, I wouldn't say things started to get really serious until I was 13, 14. I mean, still, that's a very young age, I feel like, to have to sure. kind of recognize the severity of what's going on. And what was and the escalation you went from go-karts to like what was the first kind of? Full-size car mm -hmm. uh, would have been like a, they're called late model cars yeah. so like an asphalt late model we yeah, raced yeah. a bunch of that stuff yeah. so and that was around i guess 13 i was 13 or 14 that was really when things got serious you know i would say i would say up until that point you could have gotten away with it being a hobby and 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 everything <laughs> being fine the, yeah um but then did, 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 that, the, did, the, El, did the elliot name when you were in that situation did that ever hinder you help you i mean i'm assuming help you just yeah. because i know your nature but i mean was it a thing? Like in some of those early ones, I'm trying to think if I, if you show up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of, the reason, when he said something about the kids, I totally get this, because I know I know a lot of kids that um, their parents were did things, amazing things. And it's a different kind of deal. You have to yeah. find that within yourself, right, to mm -hmm. go do that. So was that a, it, was, was it something that you dealt with or did you just kind of, did you kind of skirt it? Um, I, I, I had a thought and I just, I lost it there. But I think <laughs> in, in, in some ways, I think you probably skirt it, but in some ways, I think to your point, you have to have that desire on your own to want to go do it. And, and there were, you know, obviously I admired dad's career and always looked up to him um, from the racing side, but also had other people I looked up to right. within the in industry as well um, that, kind of helped you set that mark of, you know, 
I have a great role model here, but if I could take a little bit of this from this guy and a little bit of this from this guy and try to take some lessons from different people and, and apply them to the best of my ability. But I think for me, fortunately, even through those years, as things got serious and as things, as I was missing what normal kids were doing on the weekends with their friends, I was off racing. Um, at, at certain points in time, I might've been like, man, you know, I, I wish I was doing this. Um, but honestly, as, as time went on, I just, I, that fire and that desire to want to go and achieve that goal never went away and that never burned out. And that to me was the most important piece of, of the whole puzzle. Really. Do you remember like the first, the first time that you felt that fire that you were like, Oh, this is what Yeah, I, I mean, really it's kind of all I've ever wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, um, I remember going to the track as a little kid, you know, and obviously at the time, um, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, NASCAR was rolling and, and those are the years I remember, right? You know, dad's career goes, goes a lot further back than that. But those early 2000s years were the ones I was just barely old enough to, to remember. <clears throat> and, you know, the way I looked at it as a kid was if you weren't at the race that weekend, then you weren't living life like that. It was, it, it was a sin for you not to be at the, the race that weekend. And, um, I had such a unique vantage point. You know, my dad was a part of that show. And, and I think, you know, for that reason, I was just in awe of, of what it was and just the spectacle that NASCAR events were. And, and um, as I got older, I think I grew appreciation for the craft and the little things that go into making a driver good versus great. Um, but obviously, when you're a little kid, that first spark is just the just the spectacle that it was and, and the fact that he was a part of the show I just thought was the coolest thing ever. God, the, um, yeah. It's, well, it's courageous, too, that you, you actually, you, you do, you, you follow in those footsteps. Mm-hmm. Like, you know the size of those footsteps and then you, you follow them. Hope my kids are doctors. I was going to say, are they, do you, are they musically inclined? Golf. Do they like <clears throat> your kids? Are they? Well, I mean, it's interesting. So they're musical. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but, um, I try, not, I try not to. Sometimes I, 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 I shudder when they, you know, they'll sit. My oldest, especially, will sit at the piano and, and figure some stuff out that I know he's, that's kind of gifted that he can do. Um, and I'm going, oh, please, just you know, be a doctor or a lawyer or something. But and, but I, I get it. It's just you're trying to protect your kids. You know, it's it's hard to, generationally, it's exceptionally hard to to be successful at a craft like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been one or two in music. There's been one or two in racing. I mean, three. I mean, it, it's it's a very exceptional thing. Both of you, um, Chase and I were talking about fan bases a little bit because that's something that I think is really interesting. A parallel. You have such a rabid fan base in the church choir, but I, you've grown it on your own, right? Would you say that's right? Yeah, that's right. That you've like really. Yeah, that's right. And Chase said to me, because I was thinking about just the origin of it and the just earning what you guys have both accomplished, and Chase, you, you made a joke about inheriting your dad's fan base. And I understand why you're saying that, but the other thing is, like that's not how you become the most popular driver five times in a row, right? And also, you said something to me last winter about how important that fan base is to you, like in a really genuine way. And I was like, this is it's different. Like you talking about it feels different. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I definitely stepped into a very fortunate situation. And I think, you know, my upbringing was much different than my dad's upbringing. And I think my dad's upbringing was something that the fans could really tie to through the late 80s and, and through the 90s. You know, they didn't come from much. They were extremely hardworking and they went to the racetrack and, and made it happen in a very unique and different way than the rest of the grain was going at the time. And I think that was a really easy thing to latch on to. Um, for me, that, that wasn't the case, right? You know, I came up and, and I, to your point, I definitely had, had some opportunities that might not have had if I, you know, wasn't Bill's son. Um, but at the same time, I think the most important piece through that process is having respect for the people that are there before you at each step of the way, not just in NASCAR, but as I was coming along, you know, racing short tracks. And as I mentioned, when things started to get serious, um, you, you grow respect for those veteran guys who help shape you to be the race car driver that, that you are. And, and I think having, having that respect can make you, um, be the driver's kid that I aspire to be or, or not. And, and, 
you know, I can't, I, I didn't choose that, right? But you can certainly. Um, do you have? Do you take, have? Who are some of those guys? Like short track guys? Any guys? Any like guys? Who, who are guys? I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, short track guys. I don't, I don't know. You know, uh, Bubba Pollard and Augie Grill were, were two extremely mm-hmm. talented. I mean, we we can talk about the NASCAR people, but these were like some of the first guys that I remember going to race at, at Pensacola, which is a you know a track. Um, down in Florida that is really well known in the, in the super late model world. They have a big race down there. You're probably the biggest super late model race of the year is held down there. And we went that to was race. SRX was there last year. They, they right? raced there last year. But so hot. Yeah. But nice. No, nonetheless, you know, I just remember going down there and those guys just absolutely wearing me out, you know, and I was young, but at the time I, I got my feelings hurt really quick. But at the same time too, the more I raced with those guys, and it took me it took me a long time to get to where I could keep up with them. But once I could keep up with them, uh, because I had that respect level for how long they had been there and how bad they had whipped my ass for the past two years, um, you race them with that type of respect that they deserve. And I think because of that, those are two friendships that I carry forward to this day. Um, and and there's certainly guys like that on the NASCAR in the NASCAR world too that I look up to and. Um, have always respected and, and things like that. But I just think that that respect factor, and you touched on it a, a, minute, a minute ago, just with the well, coming along and, and making sure that there are a lot of people that were here way before you, right? In whatever industry you're, you're trying to jump into. And, and I think there's something to be said for those, those men and women who, who have kind of helped pave the way. If you're into the craft, though, to, to, to uh-huh. kind of jump on the back of what Chase said there, if you're if, if a craftsman, and you know the names he mentioned, uh, there's a lot of NASCAR people uh, that would have thought he would have mentioned four or five, six other names. But I can say from my standpoint, you know, I'm going to talk about John Prine, mm-hmm. or I'm going to talk about Leonard Cohen, or I'm going to talk about Jerry Jeff Walker, or Chris Christopherson, and there's a lot of people out there that would go, you know, who 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 is that? Now they'll know some of them, but some people want. And I think that that's a part of the craftsman part of it is um, a person who's a craftsman knows a craftsman. As uh, Kobe Bryant has one of the greatest quotes, a lion knows a lion. You can look at a lion if you're a lion and know a lion. And I think that that's something to be really great at what you do. You have to be able to identify people, not just the people that have sold the most records or won the most races, but the people that are great at their craft. Yeah. And they understand their craft. And if you know that, um, it'll allow you to be the best you can be. So that those answers, I was, I was really intrigued by, you know, because mm-hmm. um, that would have been way lower on my list of what I thought he was going to say. But I think yeah. that shows you um, the level of commitment to, to what he does. I've and I've heard so I've heard Dale Jr. talks that way about it a lot mm-hmm. too about the history of it. But I've I've heard that in football too. You know, covering different teams. And when you're in meetings and you hear stories, there are people that Josh Allen is one that people talk about. That's like that that just finds a way to find people and pay respect when he's playing against certain teams, right? Or I think that's a common thread that's pretty cool, and it makes total sense with fan bases. So with you, Eric, how did you how did you do what you did? Did you believe that you were going to have that rabbit of a fan base at a certain point, or did you was it strategic? You no. know, or no, it was reactionary. I think a lot of our things were circumstances happen, and then we react to the circumstances. You know, we um, we came out. We had how about you? Was our first song. It did okay, and then we released a song about teen pregnancy, two pink lines, because I <laughs> thought that was a good idea. That didn't work, and then we got fired from Rascal Flats tour because we didn't follow the rules, and and all these things happened. But we reacted. You played too long. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. we did. it was a bunch of things, but yeah, we can get okay, into that sorry. another time. But yeah. Okay. Um, uh, wasn't that simple, but yes, we got fired. And um, but we we reacted to those things, right? Um, and our fan base, the way we reacted is how our fan base kind of. So when we got fired from the Rascal Flats tour, um, we had like twelve shows left um, on the tour when we got fired. Taylor Swift replaced us. Our last show was Madison Square Garden, and so we get fired. And um, I didn't have anything else to do, so we. <laughs> In the rest of the cities Rascal Flats went to, their tour was called the Me and My Gang Tour. So we launched the Me and Myself Tour. So I went to all the rock clubs in the city that Rascal Flats was. So the Rascal Flats is playing the arena, right? Yeah. I was playing the little rock club down the street, and I would start my show when their show ended. 
And I did it every city that the rest of the tour. Is that your idea? I honored the entire tour, the whole thing. Like we'd show up and some nights you had like 12 people. But what I found during that time was there was a bunch of guys. It was a male driven, like at that time, people, it's crazy to think about, but it was kind of a soccer mom format. You had Martina McBride, you had Sarah Evans, you had mm-hmm. Reba McIntyre, you had you know, all these people that that's kind of who the music was. There wasn't a guy contingent. It and, was like, this one's for the girl. Like, yeah. I can hear it was like that era. Right. Of, that that right. was the era right, of country right, music. Right. So as we would go play these places, you would get like this disgruntled Southern rock, you know, classic guy, tattooed dude at the bar. And we kind of found a fan base. Like all of a sudden it started growing. We would, you know, we did the first me and myself tour or date, like for like 12 <laughs> people. And the next one, you know, it was 100. And the next one was like, by the time we got to the end of the Rascal Flats tour that I wasn't on anymore, I was stalking them. <laughs> did they know became, you were doing that? Oh, yeah, they hated it. Yeah, they knew we were doing it. But I did it as a little bit of a, you know, that. Mm-hmm. and uh, A little bit or a lot? A lot, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we get to the last one, and it was like we had a pretty big following. Like it became like a thing, and it gave us identity. We stood for something. We made a decision. I've tr- we've tried to do that our entire career. I mean, I've, I've yeah. done that. I've done that a number of times. Where I don't care if you agree with me. I'm I'm going to tell you what I think. I don't care how it affects my career. I'm just that's who I am. And mm-hmm. I think that that the real uh, the real fan base is they understand that, and I think it makes them more passionate. Okay, real quick, with the when <laughs> you were fired, was that does that happen? That doesn't happen often, no. does it? No, I don't know. If, I know. So was that? I don't really know of another one. That it happened. Okay, so that was that a strange situation to oh, yeah. navigate through? Yeah, that was the biggest act. Um, believe it or not, uh-huh. that was probably the biggest act in country music at the time. I mean, they were they Got were. It. I think they won Entertainer of the Year that year. Is it true that Taylor Swift sent you a guitar? Yep, uh, she sent me a um, her first um, gold album from her initial Tim McGraw Taylor Swift. Yeah. Um, she called me when she replaced me. I didn't find out that I was fired until she called me. Um, I was planning to go to the next show, and then she called and said, "Well, I'm doing the show." I said, "Well, okay, I guess I'm not." And um, I, I said, "Listen, you're gonna." She apologized, and I said, "Listen, you, it, don't worry about it." And I said, um, you're "That's gonna, an awesome move." I said, "You're gonna do great." I said, "They're gonna love you." And I said, "I have one request." She said, "What's that?" I said, "When you have your first gold album, I want it." And about <laughs> nine days later, <laughs> <laughs> she we're playing a festival and she shows up on the on the bus and and um, she she wrote it's in the Hall of Fame right now the record is but it says oh um, to Eric um, uh, thanks for playing too long and too loud I sincerely appreciate it Taylor Swift that was all around wow right yep. I love that story though about. I don't know what happened to her. She's building still the fan. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I think she she doing okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. might have retired. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. So. When was the first time you heard Talladega? Probably about how many songs deep into the album was it? No, I don't know that. Don't know? I don't know. However many minutes it would take from about midnight to that one. (laughs) I would say. Probably pretty quick, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, especially when that album came out, I mean, I was definitely listening a lot, and I was waiting on the next one to come out pretty pretty intently. So, yeah, yeah, not long. And what was what were your thoughts when you heard it the first time? Do you remember? Well, that to me that was one of the songs on the record that everyone was going to like, and you knew, I knew the first time I listened to it that was going to be one of the ones that everybody was going to listen to, right? And everyone was going to going to enjoy. So um, it's it's one of those songs where you listen to it, you like it, like everybody else does, and you appreciate it. But like I said again, I'm kind of trying to find the in between ones. I knew that was one of the ones that that had the star next to it. It was the way it seemed from the outside looking at it. How did you become an NASCAR fan in the first place? I grew up in North Carolina. Man, Western North Carolina. I used to go to races at North Wilkesboro, which is back in you know, one of the old school tracks, which is about 45 minutes from where I grew up. Okay. I went to Hickory Motor Speedway. They didn't have cup stuff, but they had, you know. The Jarretts, you see, Yeah, yeah, right? Dale Race and there. Ed and those guys. But um, when you grew up in North Carolina, I mean, it's almost a birthright at that time. I became a, a, became a, a, a Dale Senior fan. My dad was... Uh, a Chevy guy. I went back and forth through my life, but um, he was he's always been like a Chevy guy. So um, that was back when that mattered. You know, it doesn't probably matter as much now, but in that golden age, let's say late 80s through the 90s of NASCAR, it was really, a lot of it was about what you drove. Oh, it yeah. was about the it was about the brand of car. Yeah. Chevy. And Ford. it was really Ford or Chevy. It was really Ford right. or Chevy. That's right. I mean, that that's really what it was down to at that time, you know. Yeah. And um, 
so uh, that was, my dad was also a uh, Davy Allison fan, you know, before he died. But he, you know, it was um, just a golden era of NASCAR. I mean, I can remember um, every Sunday, you know, we would either watch or, or listen to the race. You know, that's just what we did. Yeah. So the idea for um, Talladega, was that percolating for you for a while? So ironic, yeah, but, but it wasn't about the race. It was about the experience of the people experiencing the race. You, know, you mentioned earlier about you thought you were missing out on life if you weren't. That That's it. That's the whole thing. It's not about is it racing or could it have been a football or could it have been soccer. It doesn't matter. It's about being with the people and experiencing that and letting that be a marker, a memory marker for their life. And that's really what it was. Well, ironically, when I wrote that song, I was on a bus at a festival, a July 4th in Daytona. The Daytona July 4th race was happening. And we were watching it. I was with a songwriter of mine. And we were watching the race. And I was like, man, that'd be cool. You know, so we, they showed like the infield. And you had all the people that, in their whatever, their hollers. Campers. Their, yeah. Campers, yeah. They had the flags, you know. And I was like, man, that's just such a cool, it's just like a music festival. It's like Woodstock, you know. Yeah. And, and we start talking about it's a great it. great And <laughs> we... I was like, well, we could, you know, we could just write this, but we couldn't get Daytona to line up right, you know, and for whatever reason, Talladega, Talladega lined up better. So we wrote it to that. You know, we just, we kind of picked, you know, a yeah. path using those pictures and, and wrote the song. I love the way it starts. What, so what's it like to win Talladega? No, yeah. You won the last race that was there to, in you're October. You have to take this one, okay? Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I, 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 listen, I'm a son of a bitch on a, on a snowmobile. It, I'm great on a <laughs> snowmobile. It looks like you, it. You, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you take this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah, you know, Talladega, I've always kind of looked at that race. Um, obviously, Atlanta is my home track, um, but, you know, with, with dad's success at, at Talladega and, and the special things that they did, uh, throughout throughout his career and how close it is to home it is always and, and for whatever reason fans have really kind of made it feel like a home track to me um, that has made Talladega special uh, in my eyes be just because yeah. and I guess it's because it's so close to home I don't know if it's just his past and and the you know the wins and the speed record and all that stuff you know obviously have a great significance over the course of NASCAR history um, or if it's just because it's right across state lines but nonetheless it's always kind of felt like a home race so for me to be able to to win over there is is special for that reason um, probably more than anything else you know plate racing is you know I know you're good on a snowmobile <laughs> but you could probably win one of those too I just mean let, let you know me. you gotta you it's gotta like get in the control. right spot it's but probably should not it's um it. It's, it's just one of those things that certainly have to have some things go your way, but just that atmosphere is what makes that place special to me and, mm -hmm. and how close it is to the house. Was, is there a moment, I love hearing people's explanations of when you're on the track during a race, that's just your favorite moment, other than, you know, crossing Winning. the checkers. Right, right, of course. That would be my first choice. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, <sighs> that can vary, but... There's always a point there before an event starts that, you know, NASCAR is unique, right? We're taking care of sponsors up until the time we get in the car, right? And and I think that... That's new. Yeah. I mean, as far right? as, like, uh, his history of NASCAR, we can go into that, but keep, keep going. Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. That, that, that's a whole, that's a whole different, like, that's a, that, that happened in, that's happened in music, too. That's happened in country music. If you go back to a Waylon, Merle Haggard, that era. Yeah. It was different with how they approach shows, how they approach their interaction. The people that built NASCAR is a lot of like the, actually, I would say it's the same people that built country music. They're the same people. Mm -hmm. And they did it differently than you ended up doing when commercialization got involved, money got involved. That's just part of it. I've dealt with it. And you have to do these things mm -hmm. that other people didn't have to do. Junior Johnson was not out there gripping and grinning, you know, mm -hmm. before a thing. He wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it, change, it changes. It's kind of a growing up the sport a little bit. It's got negatives and positives to me. Not, not, not to interrupt you, but that no, was, no, no, was something that I, it, I think you're spot on. When you said that, I've had to do, I've had to do that too. And there's been things that you're like, fuck, I know George Jones didn't do this, you know? Well, because. And you're, you're dealing with that kind of part. Does of it, it requires bandwidth? that you would have to be by yourself before do whatever, right? Like, do you, are you saying like leading up to the event? I'm just saying right? there's other things involved with the 
whether it's the concert or whether it's the race, then it was. It's in, not in just the, the built, music. Right. And I, I yeah. think I think a lot of those things change the, the mental capacity a little bit of how you approach it. That's just my, my opinion. Yeah. It, it changes your mechanism a little bit. And there's got to be a switch in there somewhere, mm-hmm. right, too, that, mm-hmm. that has to be flipped. And that's I'm probably the world's worst, I would say, at being able to flip that switch because when I get in and, you know, it's time to go and do your job, as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I— I take it very seriously and, and maybe too seriously some days to where to the point where you carry it home with you a little worse than you probably should. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, because of that, I, it's just how I feel like I need to be to go to perform at the level that I feel like I need to perform at. But balancing taking care of your partners and making sure everybody is, you know, all those boxes are checked. And then to get in a competitive mindset for me is something very difficult. Um, and especially with how back to back they are for us. I mean, you're, yeah. you know, take a picture, get in the car and go and go drive. So I think, th- but to answer your question, that part of the day where I get in the car and I'm putting my belts on and we're fixing to go race, that is my favorite part of Sunday, unless you win, you know, most of the time you go home mad, but every now and again, you'll get lucky and go <laughs> home happy. But that part of the day is, is really important to me because when, when you're getting in there, that's you're finally in your space. It's like, yes, I'm finally here. Let's go to work. You know, I want to go to work and do what I do what I came here to do. Is there mm-hmm. a better way to do it? I mean, in both industries, to not have to do. I understand the obligations, and you understand you've got to please the sponsors and everything and the fans. But would there be a better way? I think I think what he said was very profound. You have to be able to flip the switch. Like I I have to go do so when I go. Um, like when I go through a meet and greet or I go through what I have to do pre-show, then I go back to the bus and I have about 10 or 15 minutes that I change my mindset before I walk on stage. So it's a matter of just, at least for me, I have to have that separation for a second that I know I have to do these things, Mm -hmm. but I need a minute before I go and then do my real kind of job. And um, that's just the way I process it. What does that look like for you in that time? Um, I go to I go to the bus kind of I'm kind of alone for a minute. I kind of process where I'm at the show. I, pro- I usually have a Jack Daniels, and then I, I go play. You know, it's just it's a matter of getting in the spirit of what what got how I started doing this in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, you try to get back to that. If you'd have told the guy that was in a bar or a club, you know, 20 years ago, that you would get to go play an arena or a stadium, you have to give that a level of respect. If I'm about to walk on, so here's the thing: if you don't have a swagger. I would say the same thing. I don't. I've never driven a race car, but if you don't have that swagger when you walk out in front of that many people, or you drive a car in front of that many people, you're not. You're 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 gonna lose. Some people have it. Some people manufacture it. Doesn't matter as long as you get it there. But you can't. I don't think it's just something you can walk out and do. I think you have to have that that persona, and you have to have that confidence. Do you have a like a process? I mean, it's probably not is, Jack Daniels. No, it's Could definitely be. not. It's definitely <laughs> not, not Jack Daniels. Um, you know, I, I think for for us, it, it is different because my time that you talked about, kind of have a few minutes to yourself. That happens two or three hours before the race, and then in between those two hours before the event, I'm back to taking care of you know the partners and and the things that we do all the way up till literally you get in the car. So, but do you have it when you get in the car? When I get in the car, yes. Yeah. You know, like yeah. there's always there's always two, three, four, five minutes where, yeah. you know, you, you can kind of get your bearings right and, and understand the task at hand, kind of running back through things that I was thinking about pre-race and, and just kind of where my head is just generally on the day and, and what we need to accomplish if there's some special scenario going on, whatever it may be. But you have a few minutes to, to kind of get your, you know, get yourself back together. You held a, um, a nine flag on stage after Talladega, after Chase won. Mm-hmm. Was that two, 2019? Do you do you remember that Somewhere story? Somewhere in there, or, yeah, I think, I think you won in 19. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Where'd you get the flag? What do you remember? The crowd. Yeah. I got it from the Someone crowd. Someone gave it to you. Yeah, yeah. And we that's been that's become a part of Talladega. I, mean, I, get, I get a lot more Chase flags now, but um, you, initially it was, it, was, it was three flags. It was Dylan mm-hmm. Hart, you know, and then which is great, and then um, I, I just think the great thing about being able to do that when it becomes a, you know, these boots is that way where people raise their boots up. When you have something that I never manufactured, I never, I never said, hey, do this, 
right? Yeah. Uh, it was no, never something. There was never a cue. They just took that upon themselves to do that, and that that's some of the coolest things, at least for my career. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know, a lot of nine flags out there now, which is great. You know, so uh, after that, I was aware that Chase had won, so I grabbed that. It was a great moment for the for the crowd. Super cool. Do you remember seeing that? It was that? super cool. Yeah, somebody, uh, somebody tagged me on it mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. whatever, and and I saw it, and I was laying in bed there, whatever night it was, the, the at the next race, mm-hmm. and I was like, man, that's you know, that, obviously that was really cool for me, you know, to to see that, and uh, yeah, you know, it had been a good week too, coming off a win, you know, like that at a at a at a track like Talladega, so yeah, definitely special and meant a lot to me. Super cool. He talked about the moment for him. What is is there a moment on stage or around a show where that means more to you than any other that you would experience? I've had um, I've had a few, but uh, um, I got to do um, as far as like just uh, shows. I mean, I, I I have two that come to immediately to mind. Um, I got to um, do George Strait's last show ever when he retired in, in Texas Stadium. And I got to go out with him, and we did a couple songs, and it was just a kind of a, wow. it was just a special. I don't know. It's just one of those things to be standing beside a guy like that, and I don't know. Mm-hmm. It was just. And then the other one is um, Bruce Springsteen. He invited me to do. There was a charity event at Madison Square Garden, and he invited me, just me, to come open and then play with him. And um, you know, to be standing, we shared a microphone, so he didn't want to do. He wanted to do uh, one of his songs off the Born to Born to Run album working on the highway, but he wanted to him sing, me sing, and then we share the microphone. And there was a moment during that when you look you look at the crowd and you know I'm looking, you know, it's, it's fucking Bruce Springsteen, that I, I kinda went, okay, this is one of those moments, you know. So so for me there's there, there's a, there's more than that, but that's a couple that come to mind. Like when they're giving it back to you, like you said, right? Your yeah, songs. that that to me is the most incredible yeah. thing. i I was at your show at uh at uh, Red Rocks. When yeah, y'all, yeah, when y'all played out there, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, that's that's another great place. Yeah, I was just I, I remember specifically I was like, I just I could not imagine being in in the position to where I'm taking a, a, something that started as just a thought in my head, and this entire crowd packed out is singing it back to me. If I stop singing right now, they're gonna sing every word to me that yeah. began as a thought. Uh, that that always has blown my mind about just the musicians and the great artists and and just how you can create those those tunes out of thin air i just that yeah. that blows me away so now you're doing something different with the amphitheaters yeah. right and your tour coming up yeah. this summer i we're, take, we're taking openers for the first time we, we, we we've toured by ourselves for i uh, see eight years now where we've had no it was just us i like, didn't realize hours. every yeah. that you never did. No, we've, you never we've had, had an nobody opener. for a while, long time. It's just us, you know. So this is the first time we're actually bringing. Is that because of your experience with Rascal Flats? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Good, 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 good comment though. But no, um, I, I think um, it, it's just a, you know, at least for this next tour, when, mm-hmm. when you go out. So I've never played amphitheaters. I've never embraced kind of the tailgate thing, and at this time in my career, I just want to try it and. You can't make people sit out in the sun all day, so it was it was time to hey let's bring in some acts. And then what I enjoyed about it is you can embrace some of the younger acts that I like, that are people that um, we don't I'm not trying to sell tickets. I just I want to bring people in that I think we should champion. Cool. And I enjoyed that, you know. So be able to bring these people in, it'll, it'll be something new for us. It'll be a new way to tour. Mm-hmm. Is there someone that you're really pumped about championing? That you want I love to know all of the what's happening in the non-commercial aspect right now, the Americana aspect. There's uh, Cody Jinks, there's Whiskey Myers, there's a lot of guys that are playing with. Mm-hmm. I really like, and these aren't guys that have hit songs, but they they do incredible work, and I think that's the future of music anyway. So I'm excited about seeing that play out. What are you excited about with the future of, of NASCAR and for you? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with all that. I'm looking forward to, to seeing where that goes. Huge Whiskey Myers guy here as well. Yeah. I love their yeah. stuff. And yeah. Um, yeah, anyways, different conversation. But yeah, on the, on the NASCAR side for me, I mean, I think uh, a lot of that is kind of out of my hands. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. we're. Where his tour goes can be some of your decision, probably a lot of your decision. Who you decide to bring with you for that show or that festival is a lot of your decision. A lot of the things that NASCAR does on the weekends is not my decision. Um, frankly, I'm just a part of the I'm a part of the event, and I'm just a competitor in the event. So, 
I think for me to sit here and act like I have this perfectly mapped out story for where NASCAR goes over the next 10 years, I'd be, I'd be lying because that's Mm -hmm. just not my call. And and, uh, my job right now is to perform at a, at a high level behind the wheel. And um, I don't want, I don't want the rest of that to be my job right now anyway. So I don't know where it's headed. I I really don't. But you know, for me right now, I got a great opportunity to go and and do something I wanted to do since I was a little kid. And we'll see. Do you like the new rules changes and stuff at NASCAR? Let's say the last three or four years. Is that something you like or don't like? Some of the stuff I like, some of the stuff I don't like. Um, You know, like I tell a lot of people, I, I, I appreciate their willingness to try new things. But I think one issue you might run into with that with NASCAR is some of the stuff that doesn't work is you're going to have to look in the mirror and say, hey, this this wasn't good. And I, I think what scares me about some of those changes being made is they're not going to be able to look in the mirror and say this wasn't good and we need to maybe do this a little differently or go back here or go back there. Uh, not to say they're all bad because I think some of them can be positive too. But um, So I appreciate their willingness to try new things. Some of the things I support, some of the things I... I don't. Yep. And there's a lot of correlation. I mean, the reason I'm always intrigued by this, with NASCAR and country music, there's a number of times that, let's say, I'll use country music as the example. There's a lot of times in country music history where we kind of found ourselves, right? Let's say 90s. Mm-hmm. You had the Garth Brooks era. You had this stuff, Travis Strip, and it blew up. And then we, you know, built, we played arenas, and we did all these things. And then the music, because of that, Everybody went country, and we decide to cross it over, and we try to go pop, and then we lose ourselves, and the, the market crashes, right? And we have to find our way back to Earth. NASCAR is a lot of the same way, where you know in the late 90s, early 2000s, NASCAR is building bigger and bigger tracks. It's the fastest growing sport in the world. It's bigger than soccer. Mm-hmm. There are 200,000 fans at these places. Build, 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 build. And then because of the corporate, because of the commercialism, you lose the soul of the sport a little, right? And a lot like country music, you're gonna go through the doldrums and when that happens, you have to figure out a way to come back. And a lot of these rules changes and a lot of these things are how to adapt to that, right? So it, country music's doing the same thing and it's not always worked. But so how does it level off? Where do you- That's a great question. You meet it in that's the middle, a, how do you- That's a great question. I think, I think the soul of it you still have to have. Because I think the soul of NASCAR is very similar to the soul of country music. It's it's authentic, mm-hmm. it's real. You, if if you try to sell something that's not that, you're not you're not going to get it across. I mean, I I think that that what you just said is also just anyone that came through that pandemic. It's like you realize so much more as well the the value of just the people, right? And the genuine relationships in any business, any sort of partnership that you have. I don't know. I just think you know that that's so key, and being open and real is everything. What would you guys both say has been the toughest thing that you have endured that maybe you've overcome going on your journey in what you do? Why don't you go ahead on that one? I need a minute. Um, I think I think I got a couple, I got a, a few answers there. I mean, a lot of times that you look back on your your career. I, th- I think for me it was um, it was staying true to the the art part of it when. Um, we were in bars and we we're in clubs, and you have a label going, "Hey, this isn't working. You're going to need to play this type of song. You're going to need to cut this type of song. This is what's happening in the format." And we didn't do that. We we said, "No, it's not who we are." I realize that you may either drop us from the label, or you're not whatever. We're yeah. just not going to do that. This is who we are. You kind of stick to your guns. I see so many young artists that. They work their whole lives to get a record deal. That's their dream. And then things start to go a little bit sideways, and you have a label or somebody go, this is what we need you to do, and they do it because they just wanted it so bad. If it's not who you are, it's not going to work. And I think what for us was the real kind of a a divide in the road was, if this doesn't work, that's fine. We're still going to be who we are, and we're going to stay this path. And it was an incredibly hard moment at the time, but it made the rest of our career. And I think a lot of young artists, the pressure to not do that is enormous. And they don't do it normally. So I think for me, 
that moment was a, was a big moment. How do you um, make that decision in a moment like that, even for those it, artists? You, well, for me, I mm -hmm. made it going, okay, if I may fail anyway, I'm at least going to fail on my own you know, terms. I'm going to get enough rope to hang myself, basically. You know, for me, that was the way. I knew I could sleep at night, if I, no matter what job I had, if I had done it that way. If I had done it the other way and failed, I would always go, damn it. I knew I should have went this way. But did you have to ask people, like, because that's a hard decision to make, right? Like, that's, did you have to, like, make sure that you doing that, you know, was, yeah, I had was good, okay? I, yeah, I, I mean, you have to ask people, but at the same time, it all, it comes to yeah. here, right? But I did, I did. I was like, yeah, they want me to do this and we do that. And we, 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 we flirted with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, like any, any artist would. I mean, I, I'll admit it. I did too. And I was like, man, I can't do it. You know, so... We put out Smoke a Little Smoke, pro marijuana song, which is perfect for the time. You know? Who thought that would work? Well, everybody now. <laughs> everybody now. <laughs> Pretty legal nowadays. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, a bit of a different answer, I guess, probably more just experiences, you know, throughout my cup career. But uh, I would say, you know, leading up to the cup side, there had been a good bit of success pretty quickly. Um, and then that road to getting that first win in, in, the, in the Cup Series was pretty rocky at times. And, and there was some, and that kind of includes going home very, very disappointed, you know, on, on a few occasions. You know, having, we were fortunate, we were having opportunities to win. We just couldn't get over that hump. And it was like, well, you know, when's that going to happen? When's that going to happen? When's that going to happen? Um, and that was, that was a tough one, I think, for me to, to navigate just because I was in uncharted waters, right? I'm, you know, a young guy coming in, we're, we're running good at, at different times. We just haven't been able to get over that hump. And, and that was a, and that's a really big deal to, to be able to win in, in the Cup Series and, and something that I dreamed and had, had aspirations of, of achieving. Um, and, and that road was, it was filled with a lot of, a lot of good lessons for, for sure. At the time, didn't appreciate them, but looking back, definitely, I definitely do. And, and I think that, helped not only myself, but I think it helped our race team become who we are today. Fortunately, a lot of us are still there, kind of the same group. Um, but just that road to that first win, I, I'd say it was one of the more difficult and challenging things I've had to, to get through. What did you take away from that? What, what was the lesson that you said? Or one of them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think just uh, how to deal with the noise a little bit mm -hmm. probably would be the, the biggest one, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about, you know, your your team and your efforts and what you bring to the racetrack and how you execute your plan and 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 that and that week's race. And and I think you through those through those tough losses, I think it it teaches you what not to do in, in some cases, but I also think it, it teaches you a little bit more to have the proper amount of appreciation for when you do get across that bridge or if you do get across that bridge what it should feel like and, and, and how much appreciation you should have for it when you get there because that's a, that's a tough one to cross and, and those tough losses will, will show you how much it means to you because if you go home upset after a tough loss, it means you care. And if you had a tough loss, it means you're probably pretty close to achieving it in the first place. Well said. Well said. Yeah, very true. I agree. One thing I would still love to accomplish is Chase. When uh, I'd like to win another championship, uh, we talked about the COVID year, right? So doing one outside of the COVID year would be would be cool. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that I could probably give a, a deeper answer than that. I think, uh, but certainly just from a, a pure competition aspect of what I want to achieve within my job. I mean, you're certainly you're judged on performance, right? And you're judged on wins and losses and. Um, but just for for my own personal judgment, I want to go and and try to try to get another one. Um, you know, before we get before we get through two or three, be great. But um, being able to to win more than one is a big deal. All right, I have a different answer for that. I, I, I feel like that I've um, I've done about everything I wanted to do, and I think there's a liberating thing of that. So what I'm interested in is for the next whatever time in my career is what have I not thought about doing like it's not about I want to win this award I've won all the awards mm -hmm. I've sold all the albums I've sold out all the venues so it's a matter of what is something musically or, or I don't know, artistically that has nothing to do with any of those measurements that I want to do 
And I, I think that, I don't know, whether it's writing, whether it's a Broadway show, whether it's, I mean, any of that stuff. Like, I don't know. I'm just saying that. Is that, I, have you thought of those things? Then? No, not at all. I'm just saying, I, I don't want that to be, like, I think that not having, yeah. I don't have a mechanism now of that I need to do this. And I think that creatively, I, I, anytime you put creati creativity in the driver's seat, you win. But as long as you can lean into that, I think that um, you'll, there's cool stuff that'll happen, at least in my life, mm -hmm. in my career. So um, that's what I'm interested in. To answer, answer your question, I have no idea. But I, but I think it's fun to not it's have really an cool idea. Though. I have no clue. Like I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna chase whatever comes. Um, you have something for Eric. I, I do. You brought something. Yeah. I don't know where it okay. is. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, this is not because of my shoulder, right? No, no. But you can use it. <laughs> you said you weren't wearing a helmet? Or <laughs> I was. I was. Okay. Well, if you need a better helmet next time, uh, this might this might help. But Damn, yeah, nonetheless, so I just thought it'd be cool to bring you something. Um, that guitar that you, you signed for me after we won that first race that I uh, talked about. Uh, it's something I keep at my house, and uh, I greatly appreciate you doing it. Never yeah. had a chance to say thank you, so yeah, thank you're you. Welcome. You're welcome. And uh, yeah, so this is a oh yeah man a helmet from um, oh, that's cool. oh, 20, yeah, 2021, 2022, and wrote a little note. You don't have yeah, to read it, but no. nonetheless, no read it out loud for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, totally I'm, kidding. You can read it, just don't no, read I'm it joking. out loud. I'm joking. <laughs> but, thank no, you. Either way, but just uh, appreciate y'all doing this and having us. And how tight are these things? They just they they grip you. They, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want you don't want that have to you, move. You should, have you done the ride along type deal? No, I wouldn't, not now. But. I drove the pace car at mm -hmm. Talladega um, in 2016-17, so I got to kind of go do that that thing. Awesome. It was fantastic. Thank you for this. Yeah, ride. very welcome. Thank you. Very very cool. I have a similar thing for you. I have a similar uh, th similar theme. So this is from um, the Talladega video. I had to go get this out of the Hall of Fame. So Are this, you kidding me? no, that's it. So this Are is you? the um, this is the jacket that um, they made for the Talladega video. If you watch the video, this is it. So I couldn't think of a better person um, to have this. So wow, um, Miga. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, you got yeah, it. Yeah, thank you very much. Wow, that's there awesome. That is very cool. Your, yours comes with a much cooler story than mine. No, I no, it's not. No, it's, you it's, it's very similar. It's very similar. But that's I got it. I can't think of a better place for that to live. You know. So there you go. Very cool. We'll definitely take good wow. care of it. That you had to go get it today. We went and got out of the Hall of Fame. We'll oh, you're being serious about I'm being that? Being dead serious. Yeah. This was in the. <laughs> it was in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I definitely don't. It's no longer there. It's gone. But yeah, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not qualified so for this. So you better. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. That is it. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, 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 I guess it's the racing stripe. That was the thing when they when they yeah. did it. It was like the checker flag kind of thing. Yes. The, the whole deal. I love that. So, anyway. Yeah, checkered flag, but it's like you, until you said it, I didn't. It's it's yeah. subtle, but, yeah, but impactful. Yeah, yeah. very yeah, cool. So, there you go. That's um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Mika. Yeah, me too. Listen, you guys rock. Thank you. Thank this you. Is a really fun, fun conversation. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah.